Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. Uh, we are a progressive dialogue on culture, politics, and the critical issues of our time. I'm John Braden. I'm an educator. And we're so happy today to be joined by Harriet Fraud, who is a, a, a practicing psychotherapist in New York City, one of the founding members of the feminist movement. And Harriet is also has a project to help transform the personal and political life of the United States to make it more kind and caring and uh, democratic. Um, and so we're so lucky to have Harriet on our show today. I really think the work she's doing is just so vital and necessary. Um, and I've heard Harriet talk several times at the Left Forum. It always gives me a sense of empowerment to realize that these problems that are out there that a lot of people feel that are personal, that she's connecting it to a political, larger political phenomenon where people sort of internalize things and say, well, it's me and, you know, whether they can't find a job or just the general dynamics of the society. There's a lot of depression that people are feeling. And, and Harriet's work very brilliantly shows the political causation behind that. So, Harriet, just to introduce yourself and your work, um, we're here in Harriet's uh, uh, daughter's office, psychotherapy office here off of Union Square in, in New York City. And Harriet's going just to start by a lot of people don't even know that this work exists. You know, a lot of people don't feel there is a connection between the politics and the personal. So how would you just give a basic introduction to, to your work uh, for our audience to understand uh, what, what is it that you're doing? Well, I would say that you hold the microphone. every the political changes that we go through have huge impact. For example, Hmm. Marriage has been transformed in the United States. The only people who have what we used to call a traditional American marriage as a majority are immigrants who are visitors to America. And that marriage is over for most blue-collar families because former traditional marriages were based on a family wage given to a male, particularly if it were a white male, because the best jobs were reserved for white males. And that isn't the case anymore, as manufacturing and has gone to China, and construction has diminished and been mechanized, and computers have taken over millions upon millions of jobs. Set, we have changed from being an economy based on manufacturing and agriculture to an economy based on social services and social services jobs tend to be female jobs, women's jobs, and so that the primacy of the male wage earner, particularly at the bottom, is over. So what we've thought of as marriage is over. For the first time since they started taking the census in 1880, the majority of people who they call pr of prime marriageable age, 18 to 34 years old, are not married. And the majority of women in this country won't be married and have refused marriage, most of them. It's not just that their husbands have died. And that's because the old deal of being supported and being taken care of is gone. So that's a way that economic changes have radically altered personal life. That's an example. And also, as people have been unemployed, they're more and more frustrated. With every yeah. rise of a digit in unemployment, there's an upsurge in head injuries in emergency rooms where people have battered their children and smashed their heads. Oh. So that, you know, you can see the recession by looking at the emergency room records for shaken baby syndrome where someone in such frustration mm. shakes a little baby that so hard that its brain turns to jelly and it either dies or becomes blind or retarded or something like that. So there's an example where this is a mass phenomenon. Of course, it's, it's a terrible thing to do and the person who did it is responsible. But since it's a national phenomenon, the, the frustrations particularly of men who can't, who feel unmanned because they can't support their family. Mm. 
are being taken out on children as well as women. And people's personal relationships are separating or not happening in part because of these changes. It isn't only, you know, I'm not attractive enough or whatever. It, it has to do with that the basic economic and social underpinning of marriage is no longer there. Now, on the one hand, if the United States did what many European countries have been doing and said, okay, well, that isn't there, and these countries have fewer working women than we do, the overwhelming majority of women work in the United States, even 60% of women with children under one are in the labor force. You're talking about huge labor force participation. Half the labor force in America are women. But if you did what they've done and said, okay, we'll have really good quality public child care. In France, you can bring your child in from zero practically on and it's a dollar an hour until the child is three and then it's free and for that dollar an hour you have a head teacher with a master's degree an assistant teacher with an associate's degree a supporting pediatric nurse a sick facility for kids who are not feeling well and you have you know beautiful child care and after school care and summer care mm. and you have child allowances for people who have more than one child and the and more than two children you have if you need it you have extra supplemental money for school clothes as mm. well as free health care which is quality health care and free maternity care with somebody assigned by the government to go to your house after your child is born and help you cope mm. however a mother wants to spend the times that the child care person is assigned the woman she can say i actually need you to do the laundry mm -hmm. great <laughs> or b babysit or whatever mm -hmm. so that there's support for parenting that would make a huge difference so that it wouldn't be that when women come home they have a second shift and that men don't participate now, the more people are educated, the more they have equal relationships. So white-collar marriage of college-educated people lasts a lot longer. But then if marriage is getting to be a luxury good, it has to do with the economy. It doesn't necessarily have to do with only the failures of individuals who haven't been well-educated or who are, have blue-collar jobs. Um, yeah, we're, we're here near Union Square, uh, which uh, is a very historical park, you know, for a lot of labor, labor activism and protest movements throughout, throughout history, or at least back to the 1930s. Yeah, well, the buildings used to be Union buildings around Union Square. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh. And yet at the same time, like now, as we walk through, there seem to be a lot of uh, upscale, shishi people, you know, looking at their iPods, and they seem to sense a lot of, uh, is there any political consciousness in these, in, these, in some pe in people today, given our education system and the lack of historical consciousness, given, uh, and what is the connection between, again, happiness and the economy? We look at a country called Bhutan, which is the first country now to say that they believe that they should measure a country's success based based on net national happiness, not gross national product, but happiness. In the Constitution, it says we have the right to pursue happiness. Well, if you, how can you pursue happiness if, if every second of your life is taken up with work and, and endless work, you know, the number of hours per week we see that's going up higher and higher. I just want to thank you, Harriet, for the work that you're doing, for raising this consciousness, for getting these ideas out there. Um, so is America a happy country today? We, lo we look at the pharmaceutical industry. You have written about this, where you say that America, we have 60, we have only 5% of the world's population, and yet we consume 66% of the psychological medications. Yeah. What the heck is going on? And you've even shown research that a lot of this stuff doesn't work. Yes, 75% of the um, SSRIs for depression don't work according to the big public health studies done in England because they have 
public health care there, too, and mm -hmm. big national health studies. Our studies are mainly by the drug companies who are selling the drugs, so they're less mm -hmm. reliable. Mm -hmm. However, people are unhappy. Mm -hmm. You know, up to 15% of people are taking Prozac, which is one of the 30 drugs available for depression. And what they do is they do take the edge off, but people are unhappy for good reasons. Mm -hmm. It isn't good to just take the edge off. It's good to understand huh. what's going on and do something about it rather than be comfortably numb when you're really being cheated, when your job is disappearing, not because you didn't do well on your job, but because somebody who's already privileged is making even more money yeah. off of workers in China or Bangladesh or some other country where labor protections don't exist or exist very weakly and where salaries are low. The clothing industry has moved largely to Bangladesh where those 1,027 people, mainly women, died mm -hmm. in the garment fire. Wow. And um, that they had noticed that the building was starting to crack but they wanted to keep making clothing to sell to places like Casual Corner or Gap or whatever. Mm. And so that, you know, the business has moved away from places which protect workers' rights to live mm. and breathe and have a reasonable income. Mm. So that, you know, that has nothing to do with anybody being bad. It has to do with a system that's based on profit alone. And we'd have to question if it's a sensible thing to have hundreds uh, of thousands or millions of people in distress so someone could make more money. That doesn't make any sense. And that permeates everything in America. Buildings are built so that people can make money off of developing. New York is a great example. You can buy a fairly small lot and build an enormous skyscraper. Yeah. Well, you know, Sweden, recognizing that most people are now single, as the United States is happening in the United States and every other developed country, has taken to building housing that has small units and a collective space so people aren't isolated so that they have small units, but then they get together for meals and everyone has to contribute. They also have elder housing like mm. that. People are building housing with an eye to what people need rather mm. than just what makes the most money. And I think America, it's a hopeful time because Americans are questioning, wait a minute, maybe what makes money mm. for the 1% mm. or the top 20% and makes the 80% or the 99% suffer isn't the greatest. Mm. Maybe capitalism mm. isn't the best system. Mm. Maybe we should have some democratic form of socialism, mm. which would make more sense. And actually 49% of people under 30 years old think that socialism would be preferable to capitalism. Not that they necessarily know that much about it, mm -hmm. But they know that they can't get a job, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they have terrible debts, not because they're not smart enough, mm -hmm. but because the jobs aren't there for them. And they know that mm -hmm. their future has been compromised. Mm -hmm. They feel quite correctly that their lives are thrown on the slag heap because the big investments now are in places like Brazil and China and India. Mm -hmm. So they don't care what happens to Americans because they're making money over there, and they want to sell to those markets. So if people can't afford it here, too bad. And that is just an inhumane way. And I guess people used to accept it because they'd think, oh, well, capitalism delivers the goods. It's delivering the bads, and people are suffering. And what they haven't seen is that they're suffering in their personal lives, too, and it isn't because they need medication. It's because the social fabric that held up their lives is now ripped. And that is a job where if you work, you can make a decent living and provide for your children and support for having equal, friendly, loving relationships. 
So it's, it's very sad. Just to remind people, we are in the office of uh, Harriet's daughter, uh, Tess uh, Fraud-Wolf, who is also a psychotherapist, and thinking also about the role of psychotherapy uh, traditionally, or how it's played in our society since its founding by Freud, and this idea that you talk to people, that you have dialogue and connection and interconnection, and and what possible political meaning could be uh, to that as well. Uh, and, and I think also maybe a lack of awareness of psychotherapy today. It seems to be missing in our curriculums, you know, as we move in a kind of an anti-intellectual direction. Uh, and I think if more people were talking to each other and knew how to articulate their feelings and then to direct the feelings. But I think sometimes psychotherapy can go in the wrong direction in terms of making people feel it's their fault and let's go back to your past and why are you feeling sad instead of looking out and around at the society. And uh, so what are your thoughts about that? Well, one way to look at it is that there are four legs to a mental health table. One of the legs is close personal relationships. Either they could be sexual relationships with a sex partner or a husband or wife, or they could be close personal relationships with children, with relatives, with very close friends. Another is a wider circle of friendly relationships. Another leg of the table is some kind of social connection. Could be a PTA or a blood bank group or a political organization. And another leg, a fourth leg, is a sense of hope in your future with which you connect with people. Well, all legs in the United States are very shaky. One in four people, according to all the big studies, they come up with the same thing from Putnam's study in oh, Bowling Alone Robert to, Putnam, yeah. yes. I talk about that a lot on our show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to a yeah. later one, I think I think her name is Oldham, which is called Loneliness, mm-hmm. but um, which is one in four people have nobody to talk to, even in the worst tragedy in their lives. And so you're talking about people being mm-hmm. very isolated mm-hmm. and alone. You also are looking at personal relationships with mates that are breaking down. Mm. And it's particularly severe for men Mm. because women, when their relationships break up or they get divorced, stay connected to children, to family, and to close personal woman friends. Mm. Men don't. They often lose contact with their children and with their their wives, where the social directors of their lives And without their wives, they lose all intimate connections. And so that they're particularly in trouble. And then, but all people are in trouble. Mm. And for men, the society gives four cells rather than gives, cells four hideouts that are very lucrative. One is pornography, which is a very fast growing industry where men are heterosexual pornography has men dominating women and humiliating them so that male ascendancy is restored. The other is the military, which is chock full of rape and is a a male ascendant um, sector of the society, the richest sector, and also one of the sectors that's growing and I think it grew 81% in the last 10 years. We're always having new wars and new armaments. Another one is the NRA, which has hoodwinked men into thinking that they're buying freedom instead of just making money for gun manufacturers. And then the next one is the evangelical Christian movement in which women are to be subordinate. At the Baptist um, Convention on Men and Women, that was a basic precept. Mm. Now, that area isn't growing, but the other three are growing by leaps and bounds. Products like testosterone creams for men Mm. are some of the biggest pharmaceutical sellers because men are in trouble. And then the same system, that same capitalist system that denied them their jobs are selling them false solutions. So it's really pretty bad. 
and particularly for men. Well, I read somewhere that uh, uh, Stanley Aronowitz's daughter, uh, Nona Aronowitz Willis, did her master's thesis on comparing uh, uh, pornography in the 70s to now and how there's been a transformation that used to be, or at least in the 70s, there was a it was more egalitarian or there was a, there was a, a tendency to show the woman's uh, perspective more and that now it's sort of morphed into something which is more, uh, like you said, male dominated. Um, also thinking about like having a sense of purpose in life. When you look at people working in the corporate world today, there's this sort of a lack of meaning, you know. Look at the advertising industry, you know. Here you have an entire industry which is getting people to buy things that in many cases they don't really need. They don't even need. Uh, there's a, there was a novel uh, called um, Bonfire of the Vanities, written by Tom Wolfe, where he captures back in the 80s when you first had this widening gulf in terms of wealth inequality and how it was playing out in New York. And there's a scene where... Um, I forget the main character, he, he was at the beach, and he was a, what they call a master of the universe, you know, yes. high-flying stockbroker type, and his daughter asked him what he does for a living, and he couldn't explain it. He couldn't explain what he does, these guys in Wall Street, and he started to sweat, and he started to feel like his shaky, like how he was having an anxiety attack, and his, little, his daughter said, well, Daddy, you know, my friend's father works in publishing. He makes books. What do you make, Daddy? And the guy was having an existential crisis because he doesn't know what he does. He doesn't know, have a per So is having a sense of purpose in life too? How can we, can we transform our economy? Can we have a more uh, egalitarian distribution of wealth with, with less working hours? Would that help? If people could do things that are important. Why don't we create jobs, for example, sitting with older people, older people alone. That could be an entire industry. Green energy, that could be an industry. Wouldn't you feel great about yourself if right. you were going to work to you know, make our, 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 our ecology sustainable and save our planet from ecological suicide? These are things I found myself personally, once I became a teacher, I feel like I became a person. Because before that, I worked in the corporate world, and I felt like a, a lack of identity. So certain work comes with identity. As a psychotherapist, does that make any sense? It certainly does. I mean, it's a life with a purpose. Mm. And without a purpose, life is lonely. I mean, I have a client who's in um, public relations, and I said, well, what does public relations do? <laughs> and he says, I put whipped cream on crap. <laughs> oh, my God. So, you know... He makes money, yeah, but right. I mean, you could say after a long day, well, I put a lot of whipped cream on crap. I mean, that may not build your sense of self. Oh. And um, there is the idea of democracy at work, where workplaces yeah. work four days a week, and which are compulsory, and another compulsory day is sitting down and saying, okay, where do we want our profits to go? How much should we pay ourselves? How much should we invest in this job? Of course, they're not going to give their send their jobs to somewhere else mm. and should we invest in you know new materials should we expand where people are empowered and where no one is making so much money mm. the obvious economic thing is to list all people's needs on one side mm -hmm. all the potential economic earning uh, possibility on the other and match them up yes. and here we are we're a country with poor health care, although it's the most expensive in the world. Mm -hmm. We're a country without guaranteed public education from early childhood on. We're one of the, well, there's four countries that don't have maternity health benefits. The United States, Swaziland, Somalia, and Papua New Guinea. And us, we're and in us. that category. We're in that category. Oh, boy. Ones who do not give paid maternity leave. I mean, it's bizarre it's really bizarre now some companies will do that but that's their decision all we have is a guaranteed unpaid maternity leave and people have to negotiate that themselves and often can't afford to lose their job so um we have all these things that we could spend our wealth on you know every time they send a, a drone that's seven hundred fifty thousand in new york it costs $186,000 to put someone in prison in New York City. 
Now, for that money, of yeah. course, you could educate the person, you could mm. support their family. Wow. And if you go and visit the, the prisons, you see these guys, little kids, run up to them and fall asleep on them. And, wow. you know, wait a minute. This is crazy stuff. Yes. And 75% of them are there because they're waiting because they didn't have the bail money. So if they were rich or had access to money, they wouldn't even be there. So of course, if you gave people opportunities outside of crime, mm. if the biggest opportunity in a poor area f f wasn't to sell drugs, mm. you would have much less crime. I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious. Yes. And you wouldn't have such a punitive feeling about the society. We'd be in it together taking care of our needs, our common needs. We become very uncaring as a society, yeah. and uh, somewhere along the line, I think your work also intersects with Nell Noddings, and she's done work on an ethos of caring. Uh, you talk about emotional labor and how it's not being validated. But Harriet, I wanted to spend a little time also on your biography, because let people know how does a woman get to be where you're at now in terms of your awareness and your articulation and how you understand these issues. Uh, I know one aspect I'm fascinated by, the fact that you're married to Rick Wolf, who was one of the leading economists in our country. He was recently on Charlie Rose and, and Bill Moyers, and he's doing incredible work. I, I say you guys are the, the, the power couple of the left, you know, you get my vote for number one. But um, talk about a little bit in terms of your educational experience and in school or out of school, what made you the activist that you are and the thinker that you are today? Well, I am not sure, but there are contributing factors. One is I went to um, PS81, which was a really terrible school, I must say, in Where the Bronx. Uh, the Bronx? Are you from the Bronx? No, I was from, I was born in Manhattan, then we moved to the Bronx later. Oh, yeah. And um, it was such a rigid authoritarian school. And the music teacher had us sing the themes of all the armed forces and so on. Oh my God. And um, my family didn't, my father particularly, didn't have those values and really oh. let us know when the Rosenbergs were killed in the electric chair. Oh. I mean, for my family, that was a very sad day, even though nobody else in the class seemed to think so. Not that I was telling everyone either, but I realized that I was an outsider. And then um, I went to a much better high school, and I went to a very good college. I went to Bennington. I was a professional dancer all through high school and um, college and for a short time after college. And I think it was this need to know and the idea that I could find out and in college and in graduate school, I kind of learned you can be a learner. Mm. You can find out what you need to, and you needn't believe the people around you. Another thing that helped me a lot was that I spent several years of my young life living with different families because my father was overseas and my mother had a kind of breakdown and got TB, which a lot of more well-to-do women got as a kind of psychogenic form of TB. And I lived with various relatives. Some were Catholic, some, one was Quaker, one was atheist. They all told you that whatever they did was absolute. And I knew they were all full of it <laughs> because they were all contradictory. And so I kind of learned, don't trust adults. They will leave you with no explanation. And also that what they say as absolute isn't. And, you know, try to negotiate for yourself. Try to figure it out for yourself. So even though I didn't do very well in PS81, I was an avid reader trying to figure out things for myself. I just kind of knew better than to share them in school and so i think that really helped me plus i had a sense of justice i was a you know tiny and my older sister used to beat me senseless 
And um, I counted on her. She was my lifeline when we were sent to all these people. And so I got, you know, a sense of the underdog, although she has a sense of the underdog too because of my father's values. But that, I think, also helped me identify. I even remember when I was, I used to go alone from the Bronx to Manhattan to my dance lessons, mm. that at one point I was eight and I was on, got off at my stop and there were police beating a black man who was on his knees and handcuffed. And around them in a circle was a bunch of tourists on a tour with little name tags. And I went berserk. I screamed, don't you do that. Can't you see that? I was just wow. beside myself. And they said, get the hell out of here. We'll beat you too. Oh. So I got scared. But I just had this oh. sense of, you know, the people justice, justice yeah, yeah. and that you don't take advantage of people and you you don't beat them and you you know everybody's a human being i don't know what that man did but whatever he did it they had no right to beat him mm. and all of them so i think i just had that i had that sense of justice wow. and then i got active in college in the civil mm. rights movement mm. and then um, in the movement to end the war in Vietnam, and then was one of the founding mothers of the women's movement in New Haven, Connecticut, where I lived. And I also started an organization called Citizens Concerned About Childbirth to get midwifery rights when I was pregnant, to get midwifery rights in the hospital. And, you know, I've, my sense of justice takes me to the things that cause the injustice. And the things that cause the injustice are often political and economic. So, mm -hmm. But they're also, I had to ask myself, well, why do people go along with it? And that's a psychological question. Why go along with something if you learn in the sandbox to share? Why go along with it when people aren't sharing? If you learn that you're not supposed to hit, why do you let people get beat up all over the world? You know? Don't pick on someone smaller than you. And why are we bombing all these little countries? Mm. It's kind of, I got interested also in what in us goes along with the bully, with mm. the authority? What about the way we're raised makes us blindly obey and not say, wait a minute, mm. I, I don't think that's right. I want to do something about it. So that there's two steps. One is, wait, that isn't right, just because they act like it is. And the second thing is, what can I do about it? Long for the day when politicians start talking like you, Harriet. Yeah. I was watching uh, Hillary Clinton on TV yesterday because she got an award, some kind of award. Uh, I guess they're they're grooming her for the presidency yeah. now. They're rolling out the carpet for her there. And it, it sounded like just such cliched and sound bites and um I, I, i'm so disappointed in the clintons how you know people when they first came to power there was hopes that they were more liberal and progressive and they they been the same with obama you know but the fact that you're saying what you're saying the fact that you're educating you're giving talks around you've been writing articles in truth out magazine and um other publications it gives me a lot of hope going forward um so i think but how do we avoid from being hopeless i think because that is a key element we're dealing with now. How, what would you advise our audience members in our country in a time of darkness? How do we keep from going in despair? What is the light of hope? That's a really important question. Um, my, but there are changes. My daughter and, and I now, well, this Thursday, and then every other Thursday will be on WBAI, on Interpersonal Update, talking about these questions all over the place. There are these impulses. On October 2nd, Rick and I will be part of a discussion that's begun with a banner across Times Square on 42nd Street that says, Capitalism Works For Me, by a wonderful artist called Steve Lambert. Is French artist? Is that a French He's artist? not okay. French, but it's 
the um, project, which is called um, Crossing the Lines, is funded by the French, oh. <laughs> by Hermès and Alliance and, uh, you know, Alliance Française and all sorts of, you know, sponsors, most of them French. And then people are being given a chance to come in and ask us questions to answer whether capitalism works for them or not, and then being allowed to ask um, questions to me and to Rick about it. And that kind of thing wouldn't have happened five years ago. And I don't, I think people are ready Mm -hmm. to look for hope. I also think people who have joined evangelical movements do that because they want a hope and that the most ACA dysfunctional families, which is a brilliant new 12-step program that operates in New York, but it also operates biggest in California and all over the world. They have um, a whole world operation, and they ask these questions. They ask what's going on out there. In fact, I wrote 12 steps, um, the 12 steps to happiness. Mm. It was an article based on the 12 step programs, which are the most successful movement in the United States. Every little town has an AA. And in an an Al-Anon, even if it has nothing else that's Mm -hmm. a group, that people come in groups with a wider view. Mm. That, and so that although it talks about spirit and spiritual elements. It doesn't mean a particular denomination or church or religion. It means a spirit of hope. And so, you know, and they are fast growing because of that. And there's um, an ability to see, which was identified by Bill W., the founder of AA, And by the way, all those organizations, you're not supposed to take personal credit for anything, and it's all about the group. Mm. And he said, well, now that we've cured people of Mm. drinking, that's not enough. You need emotional sobriety. Mm. You need to be able to say, I can look at the world, I can decide what needs to be done, I can have an independence of thought as well as of feeling. I am not enslaved to the things that held me back, either chemically Mm. or emotionally with the chemicals that are released with emotional intoxication from chemicals. Because the body Mm -hmm. is a mind-body continuum. Mm. And so that when you feel a certain way, you generate biochemical reactions. Mm. And if you, you can sometimes change them with drugs, but of course then you take a drug you immediately stop it, so does the <laughs> mm. so does the solution, if it ever was one. Whereas you change your biochemistry by going through therapy or joining hopeful groups. Uh-huh. It's very interesting. Wow. Yeah, and ACA is a real wow. pioneer around that. The idea, Harry, that you said, being around hopeful people, I think it's so essential. It I find that my own self-esteem began to rise Actually, beginning in the mid-1990s, when I first discovered Al-Anon in Hoboken, where I was living at the time, and that idea that you go around the circle yes. and you get your two minutes, oh my God, and you can like say whatever you want, you can express yourself, I began to grow in that time. This is before I became a teacher. Later I became a teacher. I began to grow more. I began to learn how to express myself better, not to be so shy. Being in psychoanalysis also in my early, in my mid twenties was very very helpful to me. So um, and then um, it was about maybe in two thousand two I created an open dialogue at a bookstore in Hoboken, a symposium yeah. bookstore. It was every Wednesday night, once a week, anybody could go. And that itself was very therapeutic. I thought it was very empowering, not just for me but for other people, just to have an open topic where culture, politics, things like that, personal stories, and people look forward to that. Just sure. just going once a Connecting. week and connecting, and it was interconnection, 
And I really want to try to get back to that even with this TV show to get more people in a room, to help people find their voices. People feel very stuck and they feel that they don't know what's going on with the larger forces. So part of it is education, part of it is having an historical analysis and knowledge, but also part of it is just being able to express yourself and say, this is how I'm feeling, this is who I am, this is what I think, this is what I feel. And in a country that's becoming more constricted in our educational systems, in our work environments, you're going from cubicle to home with a lack of analysis, if you have a job, <laughs> if it, ex, exact, but it's interesting because psychoanalysis also plays a role in this. Sure. But when it's depoliticized, I think then it becomes a danger. Going back to Al-Anon, when I discovered it in my, I was in my twenties or early thirties, and I said, "Boy, this is very liberating." But I started to get a political consciousness around that time too. And as I would bring in those thoughts to the Al-Anon, they didn't want to hear that too much. They wanted to sort of, wait a minute, let's focus more on God and you. And and so there's a, there's a critique, even though the Al-Anon culture is wonderful in what it does, it's lacking the political piece, would you say? Yeah, well, I do think so. In that article, I advocated a 13th step that says, what are the social conditions that have um, made this addiction more powerful? i.e. the liquor lobbies if you're in AA, mm -hmm. the drug culture and the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. if you happen to be in NA, mm -hmm. the or f incest anonymous, the isolation of the nuclear family, mm -hmm. and the lack of help for children, you know, that there are social things as well as personal. And I do think the personal helps. I'm a psychotherapist mm -hmm. and hypnotherapist. That's very personal. But on the other hand, I've found that it helps my clients to understand what happens. For example, I have a client who, whose father was horribly brutal to him. And he said, and yet I love him. I feel sorry for him. And I said, yes, well, look at his position. He, he is unemployed. He feels unmanned. He feels frightened. His own father was brutal. And you were not only abandoned, in, you were abandoned by the whole society, left in that family. There was no one else to look out for you. There was no group at school you could talk to. There wasn't what there is in a good French school system, is you notice if a kid's going through emotional trouble and doesn't talk, and you refer them to a counselor and you look at the family. And so you're isolated and alone mm. with a brutal person. Wow. And that he, although he should never have victimized you and your sister, he is still a victim himself. Mm -hmm. And if you understand his context, you can feel sorry for him and at the same time condemn his actions. Because we need both. Yeah, yeah it's... Um... The more, you know, I'm thinking now as you're speaking about the need for this community education, you, you wrote also somewhere that, you know, relationship teaching, they should teach this in the community, it should be for free, uh, creating these kind of spaces, educational spaces. I know Stanley Aronowitz was working on something like that, other people are doing different things. Uh, so I think that's really critical and it must go forward and to realize in healing that it's part of a larger set of forces, you know, that are out there. Um, any any thoughts about that, about how we can get things started on that level? Yeah, well, in terms of thinking about yeah. group healing, ACA yeah. has done a lot of good work. They have their basic book, which is especially the appendices at the end, are really important. But what we want to create is what ACA calls and Martin Smith, who is one of the amazing thinkers in psychology, ontological security, that means security in just being a person, mm. which a lot of us come to oh. adulthood with never having feel we belong anywhere, mm. that we have no place in the world, that we're not okay. Mm -hmm. And part of what makes us okay is to understand we're like other people, that we're not mm. some kind of a weird, strange, unhappy thing person. Mm. And that's what the 12-step programs have given people, a connection, wow. a sense of we're all in it together. 
And that doesn't have to, you know, you don't, one of the things I like about ACA is you don't have to be an addict to be in it. Mm. It began as part of the adult children of alcoholics, but then, you know, it wanted to to include adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. Now that's almost every family in the whole country. So it's a lot of people because parents can't manage all alone with the mm -hmm. kids. You know, mm -hmm. there's too many things to do yes. and they're too messed up themselves. <laughs> so the children shouldn't be abandoned to the family. You need good child care and after school care and help for people. And you need help in school to learn how to be a parent mm -hmm. and to learn how to build a relationship. Mm. One of the things that's exemplary about the Swedish mm -hmm. school system's birth control program is when it gets to high school, they start teaching kids about, well, what about that other person? Mm -hmm. What about the relationship? How would you relate to another person who could be born through this? How would you work that out? What would be the best way to deal with this? Which is a very responsible question. And I remember an experiment that Planned Parenthood got a grant for, but unfortunately wasn't carried out in all the schools, that all the students in the high school had assigned a bag of flour, which was their baby. It was opened at the top. You couldn't spill it. And they had to carry it around two days a week and not spill it wherever Ooh. they went, just in the school. And they said, you know, that's what having a baby is. You can be grounded for 18 years if you really take it seriously. Be careful, you know. Yes. Uh, this is a life. This is a little life. And you don't take child development in school, so you don't understand yourself and your own personal history. And you don't understand what it's like to be a parent which are huge, huge deficits in our educational system. Wow. And, uh, you know, this whole idea of nurturing children and being nurturing should be throughout, our, I think, our society. Yes. And there's this idea that, you know, like Michael Lerner talks about the left hand of God and the right hand of God, and it seems like we've gravitated more towards the right hand, which is the punitive, which is the mm -hmm. patriarchal, the fear-based, and that we have we have to have a violent world. We have to arm ourselves to the teeth because everybody else is out trying to get us, and we have to get them before they get us. And at the same time, there's the other caring and nurturing side that we all have gotten in our childhood. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. Right. Someone had to care for us and about us and help us to grow into the who we are today. Claudia and I live in Hoboken, and this show was being broadcast in Hoboken and in other towns in Hudson County, in addition to uh, New York City in Manhattan. Uh, and the thing interesting about Hoboken is like, is a sort of friendliness. You know, you walk down the street, you see people you know, the cafe life, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a new cafe in town, and I like to sit outside. And there, is there something to that? Is there something to that community connection? Robert Putnam talks about that. He says that the mental health of a community is best determined by not how many friends you have, but how many people you can have a brief chat with on the sidewalk. Yeah, that's that wider, yeah. you know, that's the leg that is a wider mm -hmm. community of people you relate to in a friendly way. You don't even have to be working with them on mm -hmm. a project, yeah, yeah. but that you see them and you greet them. And one of the sad losses of our culture mm -hmm. is because you have mass chain stores in malls, oh. the kind of personal relationship you used to have over buying groceries or going to the drugstore or whatever is gone. You're anonymous all day. Oh, wow. And you can go to a job in which you're just a cipher in a profit ledger and so you don't count except for what you churn out. And then in you go from one kind of anonymous experience to the next. In New York, it's rare to even know the people in your building. Yes. And a um, guy that uh, owns a store nearby was telling me that he uh, said good morning to his neighbor who was quite offended, and he said, look, I'm your neighbor. He said, I don't care, you know. What? <laughs> I don't What's care. it to me? <laughs> oh, my goodness. People well, get angry if you're friendly Yeah, they, they think you're <laughs> intruding. Wow. And so that there's a, 
human component mm. that's easily missed and that we all need. Wow. That kind of friendliness. We're not educating for this. Like no. if you if you read certain philosophers, you get that need of a public sphere. I think Jur- Jurgen Habermas talks about it. But how many people today who have a degree in marketing yeah. have heard of this stuff? Do they even know? Can they even conceptualize such a thing as a public sphere? So if you're standing next to someone at a bus stop and you approach them, do they see this as a miracle of human interaction and, a, and, a, and an idea that these could be possibilities? I don't think so. I think a very small number of the population, unless you studied philosophy, Hannah Arendt talks about this web of human relationships. She always goes back to that. I'm, I'm, I'm an English professor, so I'm very interested in, in, in dialogue and, and interconnection and, and experiences on the street. Yeah. I've also been reading Martin Buber, and I, find, I read a book called uh, Between Man and Man, which where, where he gets really into his uh, theory of, of the sacredness of human dialogue and interaction, that that's where you discover yourself. And also God is found in those moments of community connection, even just a passing smile and a yeah. glance, you know? Uh, but how many folks today are aware of this stuff? I don't know. Very few. Yeah. I mean, I had an experience that just exemplifies it. Mm-hmm. I was walking across 9th Street, mm-hmm. and uh, there's an entrance to the PATH train there, and this man with an attache case is racing across the street, and he bumped the leg of another man who was standing there, an African-American man who got furious, and he was screaming, you don't even see me. You oh. don't even see me, because the man who bumped him with his attache case didn't even say, oh, I'm sorry, or oh, some little yes, moment. Yes. And I walked fairly near him, and I said, I see you. And he said, oh. thank you. Oh. It was just a sweet, that moment wow. of connection that sort of says we're people together. Oh. You know? Oh, my goodness. And it, it was just like two seconds... And you could see him calm down, that he was recognized, that that wasn't right, you know, that there is a connection. And people see that you are a human being who deserves to be recognized Mm. as a human being and, you know, who deserves some recognition, not maybe a huge celebration we're not talking about, but the little moments of connection that you can have. You can have that on the subway. You know, I was riding in this crushed up subway car of everybody, and I said to this guy who looked a little tough, and I was kind of leaning against him, I said, look, I'm not trying to cuddle. It's the subway. And we got to talking. We got to have a nice moment together. He said, oh, I know you're not trying to cuddle. And, you know, he was sweet. Because there are these, because we're all people together. And... New York is actually a kind of friendly place that way. You can can talk to people easily. They don't Mm. think you're crazy if you start a conversation. But those are the things that sustain people, I think. Those moments of connection, either intimate connection, wider, wider, in groups, Mm. wherever. That's what we need as people, to be connected. It's the most basic human need. I'm so glad we're having this conversation, uh, Harriet. Claudia says we have three minutes left, and uh, so I'm really happy that, boy, this has been amazing. And I, I realize now, especially more than ever, that we need to have these discussions in the community. People watching us at home, you're important. You're special. You know, you need to be noticed and recognized. And maybe people found us channel surfing today or something. But, you know, yeah. we need to gather together. Maybe every block should have like a, every building should have like a community room where yeah. they take turns facilitating. Just discussion. You know, have some light refreshments, some healthy food. Absolutely. And discussion, yeah. You know, they have that at some very upscale condos. They have the book club because they're sure that uh, they're, they're sure that um, non people without money can't get in. Right. But so they have book clubs. They have a public meeting room. Uh, they have that's the the Meyer Building yeah. on one um, 
what is it called, Grand Army Plaza is a gorgeous architectural building with very expensive apartments. Mm -hmm. I think it's th they started at $2 million. Wow. But they have a community room. They have a, a billiards room for pool. They have a book club for the building. They have potlucks for the building. Wow. And I think it's because they can all trust nobody who wasn't <laughs> rich could live there. <laughs> right, right. But that they can, wow. they recognize that. And we all should in every yes. building. And the building should be built uh -huh. to accommodate our need to connect. Harriet, this has been so wonderful. I, every time I you know, hear you speak, but it's even better to be able to have a dialogue with you. And um, uh, closing thoughts, we only have a few seconds left, but just final thoughts to give some people hope for a better world that might be. We're all here. We're all here sharing our towns, our lives, our experiences as humans, which aren't all that different. And we all need each other. And knowing that, even if it's in the tiny moments of brushing against another human being in your day, remember, we're in this together. And if you can join something that you believe in, if you can find the time and the spirit and the hope to do that, mm. that's another step. And if you can try to work for a better world where this is made more possible, that's still another, and they all count. Thank you so much for being with us today, Harriet. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And you're always welcome back. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay. A little aesthetic uh, avant-garde, you know. We were <laughs> and, and to the, yeah. And that's <laughs> Thank you.